Steve's life followed a regimen, which helped him keep things under control, and possibly helped him achieve great success in his career. Early mornings. Trips to the gym. Scheduled meetings at work. And business partner engagements were all part of his routine. Up until she moved in with him. Even his dates with his fiancée Rena were carefully scheduled for Tuesdays, Saturdays, and sometimes Thursdays. Steve's life was well-ordered and satisfying, since every aspect of it fit into the format of his notebook and flowed with its rhythm. But Steve's fancy leather-bound diary hid a side to his life that was not discussed. It didn't say that Steve was about to ruin a crucial meeting to mourn his younger sister, whom he loved. Steve was staring out of an airplane window, his mind far from the lovely clouds below, even though he was deeply in love with her. After two years gone, he was traveling to his hometown in the plane, taking him back in time. Steve's relationship with his hometown wasn't motivated by nostalgia at this time. He had no affection for the location where, as a small child, he had argued with his parents. They had thought he would become a dentist. But Steve would not allow money to buy authenticity. He also hated his town's boring routine, drab environment, and peaceful streetcars. He yearned for the busy metropolis, a place where he might reach his full potential, both physically and spiritually. When Steve was 18, he made a risky move in spite of his parents' worries. After packing his things and leaving a letter, he left the small town he couldn't force himself to appreciate, and set out to build a profession. After moving in with a friend, Steve started a part-time work and, a year later, made amends with his parents. Time had passed but they were still unwilling to accept their son's decisions and forgive his leaving. Thankfully, Steve made the right choice. With a natural aptitude for cars and a strong sense of business, he skillfully made contacts and, in less than four years, obtained funding from sponsors to launch his own firm, which is a specialty shop that sells auto parts, accessories, and consumables for vehicles of all makes and models. The company quickly blossomed, growing from one auto parts store to eight. And he also added gas stations and auto repair shops under his name. Steve even went so far as to host drift enthusiast races and tuned car shows, seeing them as useful marketing tools for his growing chain of retail locations. In the flurry of business, Steve inadvertently forgot about his family. But after he was successful, he threw himself into helping his parents, giving them money, calling on holidays, and inviting them to his house. Sadly, his family ignored him and refused to support him in his endeavors. They'd once been dragged into the city, but they'd never quite adapted to the beehive-like urban turmoil. Steve thought his life was ideal when he was 28 years old. But destiny had other ideas. That year's fall saw Steve's mother pass away from illness. It was too late to say goodbye to her when Steve got to the hospital. For a brief while, the tragedy made Steve and his father closer. But the father's grief over his wife's passing was so great that he soon followed her to the hereafter. Meg. Steve's younger sister, had just turned 18 at that point. She would not, however, budge to move in with her brother. Steve, appreciating her independence, did not pursue the issue. Recognizing her capacity for self-sufficiency, you're mistaken to believe that I am incapable of managing things on my own. She put her hands on her hips and looked at her brother who had a severe expression on his face. That made them think of their mother. I've managed without you all these years. And I'll continue. She said. 
she brought up the fact that many students relocate for school to live in dorms in different towns or even different nations. She also had a scholarship at her institution, which was conveniently close to her flat. Steve tried to talk her out of it by suggesting that she move to a different university. But his sister was as obstinate as a sheep. After a while, Steve gave up and became his sister's biggest supporter. Even with the support, they hardly ever met in person and instead spoke primarily via video conversations. Aligning their schedules proved to be difficult for Meg, who was dedicated to her university academics and friends, and Steve, who was devoted to his business. Steve harbored a nagging suspicion that Meg might be seeing someone else. But she never brought him up and just dismissed the question. Meg last saw Steve in August, which was during the summer. She had just finished her fourth year of veterinary science at the university when he extended an invitation for her to stay starting in June. Even though it interfered with his already full schedule, Steve was kind enough to pay for Meg's tickets to the city and treated her to a variety of entertainment. He set aside valuable time to spend with his younger sister. Meg, on the other hand, blamed her manner on exam fatigue for her unusually quiet and reflective behavior during the visit. Rena, Steve's fiance, began acting unusually irritated about the same time. Rena appeared to be feeling envious of Steve's time and effort spent on his younger sister. Theirs had never been a happy one. And Rena frequently showed her contempt for Meg by calling her a cheap actress. Meg, on the other hand, was not shy about expressing her dissatisfaction. She frequently reacted angrily to any patronizing comments. Rena made about her preferences appearance or haircut steve decided against getting involved brushing off the conflict as a passing fad and counting on the two women to sort things out on their own he was not going to tell rena that meg was the only family he had left behind but now steve felt guilty for not spending more time with meg he wondered if he ought to have made more of an effort in their connection or maintained her in his city. The courteous voice of a nearby waitress offering. Refreshments cut through his thoughts. Would you like some wine? Perhaps juice or water? Sir. She asked. Practicing her prepared grin while holding a bottle of wine. No. Thank you. Steve said. Glancing back towards the window and meeting. The eyes of a gorgeous blonde stewardess, wearing a neck scarf and red uniform cap. Though her attractive grin persisted, ready to top off his drink, Steve's attention had been fixed on the outside scenery since the start of the flight. Steve was unable to indulge, even though there were constant attempts to feed him appetizers and get him wasted on champagne. The picture of his sister's face from their most recent rendezvous at the airport was all that was on his thoughts. It was a moving recollection. Meg had been hesitant to say goodbye to him, pacing back and forth while attempting to convey a significant message. She looked up at him and said, Steve, you know I want to say. But just as they were finishing up their talk, a woman's voice over the speakers announced that Meg's aircraft was about to embark. Meg expressed nothing of what she had wanted to say. Steve reminded her. You were going to say something. She let out a sigh and forced a forced smile. Well. Don't bother. Not really important. Later on. We'll chat more. My big brother. Goodbye with his sister's head almost touching his shoulder. Steve gave her an embrace. Running towards the terminal, she turned around and waved goodbye. Steve didn't realize it was a lie. Meg disappeared from his life following that meeting. 
claiming among other things that she had a lot on at the institution. Steve got a call later. But it wasn't from his sister. Feeling as though sand had been poured into his eyes, he wrinkled his nose and closed his fatigued eyelids. He had not been able to sleep for however long. His first thought upon receiving the call was that it was a cruel joke. Twenty-somethings don't leave this planet. Especially not one as intelligent and kind as Meg. Steve couldn't remember when he'd slept. And it felt too cruel. After giving it some thinking. He wondered if his first ideas were still suitable given this unfortunate situation. Steve tried to keep his attention on more realistic things. But his thoughts would not stay still. He thought about the paradox that while there are many. Wicked people living off the taxes paid. By regular taxpayers in prisons. Young. Good-hearted people are the ones who frequently. Meet an early and untimely end. Justice was an elusive concept that severely disturbed him. Steve clung to the hope that it was all a mistake. Even as he double-checked everything and found himself traveling to the assigned spot to identify his sister. Steve was thinking all of these things and missed the plane landing. He could not remember getting into his seat, answering the stewardess's inquiries, or hailing a cab. He eventually turned to see Meg's blank white face. She had permanently closed her eyelids and stopped smiling. The investigator gave a solemn explanation of the unfortunate events. Meg had perished in an ice road traffic collision. Steve couldn't bring himself to trust the driver's account of her. Reportedly jumping in front of the car. He felt there was a problem with his sister. She had given up on her goals and left the university. Without telling him when she was back. The depressing disclosures didn't stop there. Unexpectedly. Steve was told to go see a children's hospital. He was overwhelmed and confused. But complied when they put him in a car and drove him there. A middle-aged doctor in a white coat led Steve confidently. Through the hospital's corridors while making lively gestures. And inspecting stuff along the way. Steve tried to follow the story but he had trouble picking up on the main plot point. Steve was staring at Meg's motionless face. Like some kind of menacing mask. The doctor escorted Steve around the hospital halls. While maintaining a confident conversation. Passing along information. It was revealed that Meg's daughter had been. Delivered prematurely and needed particular attention. Steve wiped his face with his palms trying to get rid of the shock and exhaustion. But the vision remained. He was confused and said. Whose daughter? Your sister's daughter. The physician said in a composed tone. She was in her 34th obstetric week. Eight months pregnant. Did you know that? Two. Steve paused. Then rejected it with a shake of his head. This summer. I saw her. She withheld nothing from me. He remembered his sister's confused look. As they bid each other farewell. Maybe it was what she wished to convey. She had turned down Steve's invitation to Christmas. Citing prior engagements with friends and. Bringing up something regarding her education. It seemed now that she had been hiding her pregnancy. Instead of passing judgment on her. Steve, being the kind person that he is, would have given her support and understanding. The physician proceeded with his explanation, muffled as though by cotton absorbent. Despite being miraculously preserved under the circumstances, the early birth put the infant at risk of serious diseases. The mother's health played a major role in the circumstance. The doctor told Steve that he could take the baby home. If there were no issues. Even though the baby was fragile. Home. Steve echoed. Shocked. Yes. With you. The physician said as he looked over some paperwork. As the only relative and her uncle. Your name is on your sister's papers. Steve blinked and furrowed his brows. 
taking in the news. Had he grown into an uncle? Steve struggled to accept the truth that he would now have to take care of the infant. He came to the realization that he understood nothing about child care. Diapers were an unfamiliar notion. And he had never given thought to starting a family. Even after they were married. Rihanna. His fiance, Had made it plain that she had no desire to have children. She was a model with dreams of acting. She was committed to her work and had neither. Maternal instincts or feelings of sympathy for other people's kids. Steve had never connected deeply with kids either. Lost in his business. Immersed in the fast-paced world of the metropolis. He thought that motherhood will come to her own. Natural conclusion in due course. But he was confused by the unexpected news that he was now an uncle. And by the sudden burden of taking care of his sister's child. The doctor escorted Steve inside the ward after opening the door. Without realizing the confusion in Steve's mind. The infant. Small enough to fit into Steve's hand. Slept soundly. Steve wiped perspiration from his brow. Turned to face the baby. And yelled a curse word out loud. Earning the doctor a furious frown. I apologize. It was a complete surprise. Steve said, attempting to gather his thoughts. The doctor said. You can give up the baby. Right away. If you leave her here. An orphanage will receive her. The child welfare authorities have already been informed by us. That is the guidelines. Steve forcefully swallowed. Struggling to control a lump in his throat. It was deeply painful to consider leaving behind his sister's daughter. The only thing that was left of her. Certainly not enough for him to even consider the possibility. But now that he was in this predicament. What else could he do? Get a nanny. I take it. Steve announced that he was relieved. That everything appeared to be back under control. And that it wouldn't be a problem. Offering to pay any amount. It's just a child. I can handle it. He told himself. With a nod. The physician endorsed his choice. That is a wise concept. Indeed. But. I suggest employing a nanny with experience. Ideally in medicine. The doctor suggested. Steve asked the doctor if he thought the father should be involved. And he shook his head. Get in touch with child welfare officials right away. She will continue to be supervised by us for the time being. He proposed. Steve nodded and gave the kid a quick look. Steve felt a little uneasy since she. Seemed motionless and unresponsive. Did she even have a breath? He was relieved. Though. When the newborn girl yawned out of nowhere. And thus Steve's life began to spin out of control. Steve's contacts helped speed the funeral. Arrangements and the child's custody. A significant agreement with a foreign partner. Was at jeopardy in the interim. By the time his forced vacation was up. Steve was close to losing his mind. He discovered he had forgotten to hire a nanny. When he went to the maternity hospital to pick up his niece. Leaving him without time to set up a casting. Steve tried calling the secretary to try and assign her the search. But the line was always busy. When he got to the right ward. He paused at the threshold. A young nurse was giggling over his niece. While reciting a nursery rhyme or counting rhyme. The nurse handled the infant expertly. Moving with confidence and accuracy. She had the kid securely wrapped in a diaper in a matter of moments. It didn't take Sherlock's thinking to figure out that. This girl had a background in medicine and. Would make a great nanny for his niece. Fueled by the same feeling he gets when a brilliant idea presents itself. Steve trusted his gut and strode into the room. Stowing his smartphone. Steve questioned directly. Skipping the customary salutation. Would you consider changing your place of work? 
The nurse flinched, turning to face the unexpected guest. While holding the infant tightly out of terror. She was really beautiful. With light blonde hair. Blue eyes. A sharp chin. And slim facial features. Instead of seeing Steve as a man wearing a fancy suit. She looked at him like a patient in a mental hospital. Steve decided to start over and admitted that. He had been frightened and had lost his ability to communicate during the past few days. Sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. I'm Steve Barrow. And I'm this baby's uncle. He said. The nurse's eyes grew wide. Fluttering without mascara on her curving lashes. Her eyes then became pitiful. She said. Oh. So you're here for Zoe. Right? The coincidence astounded Steve. And Zoe's nurse turned away. Flushed profusely. I had to name her somehow. But of course. You can give her another name. She said. Steve had not given that possibility much thought. He asked. Listen. What's your name? Faith. Was the nurse's response as she gently rocked the infant back to sleep. Faith Hagen. Nice to meet you. Faith. The thing is. I have to leave for my city. And the baby needs care. Which I know nothing about. I don't have time to find a nanny. And you seem to fulfill your duties quite conscientiously. Um. Zoe seems to be very pleased with your care. I swear I can't even hold her in my arms. I'll crush her. Steve said. The nurse gave a small smile before gathering herself. Steve let out a deep sigh and asked. What are you getting at? I'm offering you a job and substantial pay. Big money that you won't earn here. Just come with me to my city and take care of Zoe. I have a big house. And you'll have a private room. Steve put forth. Sensing that he could rely on the woman with her little niece and her blue eyes and blonde braid. He was pleasantly surprised when the girl declined. This strange offer without saying no. Steve had expected to have to press the issue. But instead she pursed her lips and said. How much are you going to pay the nanny? With caution. Name any figure. Steve said firmly. Steve was honest. He was willing to pay whatever amount to. Share some of the baby's responsibilities. Give me a number. And we'll discuss it and come to an agreement. I can negotiate with the head doctor too so they'll let you go. I've heard about you. Faith remarked. Giving the sleeping baby a tender glance. She looked at Steve after that. I need money. She said. Fixing a determined gaze on his face. And I need your help. The businessman replied, grinning widely and extending his hand in a formal manner. So. We need each other. Deal. Faith gently transferred the baby into Steve's hand and said. Deal. Steve gave it a tiny squeeze and the sale was completed. Steve's business instinct had never failed him. And he was sure that by following his gut feeling today. He had not erred. Still, he was unable to even speculate as to what modifications their hands would make. Steve scowled as the cabbie pulled up in front of the two-story mansion in front of the white Lexus. From every one of the first floor's panoramic windows, there was a slight burn. Faith, looking pale after the travel, sat with the infant in the back seat. It was her first flight. So even though the trip wasn't very long, she was really worried about the baby's reaction. Luckily, everything proceeded without a hitch. Zoe slept through it all, apparently unaffected by the turbulence or the clouds. Steve was exhausted as well and all he could think about was getting into bed and downing a glass of whiskey. But instead of welcoming him home with a warm silence, 
The house was filled with music. Faith inquired as they approached the large hall. Are you having a party? Steve spoke an unsure. Must be. Two dozen people. Models. Actors. Bloggers. Crowded the room. And the smells of pricey fragrances mixed weirdly. With the aromas of the unusual food that the hostess was serving to her guests. Steve had previously mixed with such a society. But he had never truly been a part of it. He knew how to put on a good grin and say the right things to the appropriate people. But he was happier in his garage doing work. Often he would compare this gaudy gloss to a coat of gilding or fancy paint put on a car's exterior to hide rust. Taking in the guest's fashionable attire, the glimmer of their jewelry, and their faux grins. Now, especially at such a trying time for him, Steve was too tired from the travel and the previous events to fully understand what was going on in his home. Luckily, the solution was obvious. Rena, sensing the coming, stepped out from the throng, elegant and slender, carrying a glass of wine and proudly displaying the enormous engagement ring for all to see. Instead of giving Steve the responsibility of selecting the engagement ring, she had done it herself. Steve observed the bride smile and grimaced in his head. She had been celebrating like Gollum ever. Since she got the desired engagement ring, she even went so far as to refer to the jewelry as my precious. And she started showing off her status to everybody. The ring was clearly another example of the model's attempt to project an air of propriety as the mistress of the house. Steve. She yelled, encircling the groom's neck with her arms to prevent the Prosecco from spilling. Oh, I missed you so much. Darling, Steve said, jealously, and you couldn't cope with boredom alone. Not that he was against parties of this kind, but this was not the proper moment. And you invited the closest people to support you, right? He asked. How Rena hadn't come up with this idea on her own was beyond him. He had returned from a funeral, not from Bali and his meeting with the German team was scheduled for Monday. Rena kissed him playfully on the cheek, then turned to look at Faith and Zoe. The baby's face was getting redder and wrinkled, already awake and ready to cry. The blonde frowned, staring at the strangers and the bags containing items belonging to children, asking, Who the hell is this? Steve tried to remember why he hadn't told his fiance earlier. Faith and Zoe. They'll be living with us. He said. But it had only been two days since he'd met Zoe. With her lips painted red, Rena's mouth was hanging open. She turned to face Steve. Thinking he would chuckle and tell her he was kidding. But when he heard the infant start to cry. Steve had already turned his back on his bride. I'll take you to your room. Only the children's furniture will be brought tomorrow. My secretary took care of everything. He said Faith. Rena gripped to Steve as he barely took a step. But she nodded and followed him. The remarks were harsh. But Steve understood that this was not your typical scenario. Are you kidding me? You went to another town. And came back with a girl and a baby. And you think you can leave without explaining everything to me? Don't you? Steve said. He ought to have spoken with his wife sooner. He seized her hand and pressed his lips to her fingers. I'll come back in a couple of minutes. And we'll talk. Okay. He replied. He nodded to Faith before he waited for her response. Steve gave Faith a second floor room with a balcony and a separate bathroom. He first offered to put the baby in a different room. But Faith objected. Saying that the child needed to be observed at night. He told the nanny. 
Don't be shy. You can walk around the house and use all the things. The food in the fridge is all yours. We rarely cook. But I'll order you breakfast if you want. Have dinner. Then. The girl waved aside, starting to undress the sobbing Zoe in preparation for changing her diaper. I'm not hungry. I ate on the airplane. She said. Steve saw her assured motions and knew he had made the right decision once more. It was obvious that this nurse had been assigned to him on the flight. He grew even fonder of the girl once they had chance to talk about their cooperation. She was composed, courteous, and witty. Faith made reference to the need for money to support her family. But she did not elaborate. Steve decided not to ask any more questions and gave Faith full custody of the infant. Seeking comfort. He went down to the boisterous celebration below. Obliging the drunken visitors who tried to make small talk with him. He poured himself a drink at the bar. And Rena. Who was carrying a glass already. Joined him. Glaring at him as they took a seat in an armchair far. From the center of the festivities. Steve gave Rena an explanation of the problem. But she was already quite drunk and wasn't happy. Saying. This is not normal. I'm against it. There was a shattering sound in the kitchen. And Steve closed his eyes for a moment and inhaled deeply. I want your guests to leave. I need to rest. He said Rena firmly. Averting a confrontation. Are your guests to leave too? Rena angrily motioned toward the second story. As if Faith were standing on the steps. Steve restated. The nanny and the baby will live here. But Rena voiced her displeasure without consulting anyone else. And offered suggestions like a hotel room or. An independent residence in the rear. Steve tried to console her by offering to take them somewhere else. Rena objected. Saying. I don't want to share this house with another woman. Anyway. A baby belongs in the country. Not orphanages. She reminisced about her mornings filled with yoga, massages, ambitions, and espresso, and contrasted them with the current scenario of baby crying, music, other people laughing, and a mixture of perfumes that made Steve angry. Mina demanded, Get them a hotel room. Do you want a baby to live in a hotel? Really? Steve unimpressed thought of other options he was irritated by rena's frenzy since she ought to have been encouraging him rather than acting as though he had brought her mistress and her infant into the house rena never even asked him how he was feeling not even after he lost his final relative the sister steve said gripping the glass firmly she's my child Rena. She's mine from now on. Mina's face went pale. And she pursed her lips and shot a furious look at her fiancé. Replied. Steve. This is not your child. Your sister gave birth. And we don't even know who the father is. How do we know what kind of heredity the baby has? Who knows? Steve firmly responded. Rena. Don't overreact. In an attempt to defuse the issue. Nevertheless. The passionate woman persisted in her viewpoint. Refusing to take accountability for the transgressions of others. And rejecting the notion of raising a child. Who would scream and contaminate herself. Steve was shocked to learn that Rena detested kids so much. And assumed she was worried about her weight. And modeling career. But it was clear that she was speaking to the infant with a great deal of bitterness. Steve took a good swig of whiskey and tried not to lose his cool. It's not like I'm forcing you. It's just asking. Get over it. I'm not asking you to take care of the baby. 
Just accept that I have Zoe now. He said. In response. Steve became enraged and threw the glass against the wall. Shattering it into many shards and leaving. A wet trace of alcohol on the wallpaper. Rena tensed. Clenched her fists. And leaned forward. Issuing an ultimatum. No. Steve. Choose either me or this little monster. With a cry, Rena covered her lips with her palm and showed dread in her wide eyes. As though the glass had broken against her platinum curls of a head. The man yelled. Then get out. Steve was looking at her tiredly when he suddenly. Remembered a fight he had with Rena. She played the tragic heroine during the argument. Holding his hands tenderly and spoke to him in a pitiful. Quivering voice. She appeared to be fixated on her beauty at that moment. As she squinted into the mirror across from her. He didn't understand why she was being so dramatic at the moment. It dawned on him now that the budding actress was acting. Out her feelings for him like she was on stage. With her voice quivering and her eyes frozen. Rena questioned. What have you said? Steve said. Massaging his forehead to drive away his migraine. Go away. Rena. Before the circus demolished his house. He persuaded her to take it with her. Choosing not to get into any more stupid disputes. He got up and went to his bedroom. Without taking off his clothes. He collapsed into the bed and fell fast into a deep. Dreamless slumber. Steve knew he had overslept the following morning. Before he even opened his eyes. He shoved himself out of bed and looked at his watch. Ignoring the throbbing headache and tenseness in his body. No. He moaned as he ruffled his hair with his fingers. And rested his elbows on his knees. He was used to following a rigid routine and was seldom late. Everything seems to be thrown off now. As he stepped into the hallway. He heard a toddler sobbing. He smiled involuntarily as he thought back to the doctor's confirmation that the boy was unwell, but that his lungs were fine. He had no time to spare. Yet his curiosity overcame him. He went downstairs to the first floor, where the noises came from. The nanny was in the kitchen, where the faint odor of freshly made pancakes had replaced the remnants of previous revelries. A little pile of them graced the table. And a craving for breakfast churned in Steve's stomach. Faith watched the snowflakes as she stood. By the large window. She was holding a clean bodysuit clad Zoe and. Nursing her with a bottle of baby formula. Faith said to the youngster. Taking in the sight of the snow. Do you see how beautiful it is outside? Steve leaned against the doorframe and watched the sight. Saying, if you eat and sleep well, we will go out often. Faith spoke to the baby as though it could understand her. After his comment, back on the plane, she had looked at Stephen dignifiedly and underlined the value of talking to kids. Have you gotten used to the house? Steve asked with a smile that made him stand out as he went to get a cup of coffee. The nurse gave a nod. Turning around. Despite her humble look, Steve valued her honesty and her willingness to make the most of what was available. The girl looked at the coffee machine and mumbled. I couldn't figure out this machine. With resentment. Laughing. Steve offered to demonstrate its operation for her. He became aware of how quickly time was passing. As he finished explaining everything. Had he ever let himself waste time that way before? No. Still. He found himself wanting to stay longer because of. The young woman's strangely comforting sense of home. Maybe it was because she was looking for his niece. Or maybe it was because she was from his hometown. After enjoying a few very tasty pancakes. Steve noticed a slight change in his mood as he thought. About the unexpected coziness this circumstance.
provided for his household. Steve took a shower, answered some domestic inquiries from the babysitter, and hurried off to his meeting. He came on time, miraculously. Or maybe his partners were late. Steve felt better after the discussion. And for a short while he thought about calling Rena to apologize for his earlier actions. But workday routine soon overtook him. And he had only called to check on the child and nanny throughout the week, rather than seeing them in person. During these calls, Faith's voice was consistently upbeat, indicating that she was enjoying her time with the child. Steve was at a loss as to what was so alluring about it. He got home long after midnight on a Friday night, and heard Zoe sobbing in the bedroom. He listened for a moment as he passed by, not wanting to embarrass the nanny by knocking. Abruptly, he heard Faith sing, her voice soft, comforting, real. Rena came back during the weekend. She gave her fiancé a tender massage, putting her arms around his neck and kissing his cheek. Living together once more proved difficult. Though, Rena took every chance to belittle Faith or lash out at her. She made a snide remark about Faith's appearance, implying that her clothes were from a thrift shop. Faith smiled back, deftly blocking the punch. I'm wearing something from your closet. Don't you recognize it? The girl didn't seem to be bothered by her employer's fiancé's actions. She behaved politely and avoided conflict, either answering with the same light-hearted banter or choosing to ignore Rena. Rena would frequently raise her eyebrows in the living room at the sight of the infant and the nanny. It smells like something, she said, putting down her phone. Are you even watching the baby? Maybe she needs her diaper changed. With a gracious smile, Faith offered the well-groomed blonde a playful grip on the drooling infant. The woman quickly retreated, keeping her distance from Faith and Zoe in the face of such a possibility. Rena would always pretend to cover her ears any time the baby sobbed, or even made a small sound, complaining that the noise was giving her migraines. But Faith was certain that Rena's migraines had less to do with the baby and more to do with the rowdy parties and copious amounts of cocktails she drank. The fact that Steve seemed at ease around the baby and the nanny worried Rena even more. After first avoiding eye contact with Zoe, Steve began to pay closer attention to the young child. When he noticed similarities in her face, that matched Meg's dark hair. Eventually, the uncertainty in Steve's soul gave way to a humble, loving resignation. Steve melted entirely beneath Zoe's gaze. When the three-month-old girl smiled at her uncle, and held his index finger in her little fist. The stronger his bond became with the infant. The more so that he began seeing Zoe first thing after work. Rena became enraged by this development and expressed her anger. You are spending too much time with this child. She said. Come on. Rena. You're not jealous of the child. Are you? Steve waved her off. That's correct. Rena. You're merely her guardian. She's my niece. He said. Dismissing her irate cries. He declined to consider taking Zoe under his adoption. Steve. Of course. Became close to Faith as well. At first. They talked about Zoe a lot. But eventually. They talked about other things. It turned out that the young nurse was intelligent and engaging. If Steve could have the time. They would spend hours in the living room talking about books. The newest events in the news. Listening to music. Or delving into philosophical subjects like. The amount of money required to be happy. What one should leave behind in this world. The existence of soulmates. 
and the age-old query of whether life is meaningful. These conversations typically happened enthusiastically over dinner. Which Steve would either order from a restaurant or, if Faith had the time, cook herself. Steve was not conversant with the nuances of medicine. And Faith knew very little about vehicles. But they both had a fascination for old movies and world history. Though they disagreed. They got into fervent debates about a range of subjects. Despite the fact that Steve was her supervisor. Faith never shied away from speaking her mind and he respected it. Steve's longing for these kinds of talks was unfathomable. Most of his chats were business-related. And Rena talked about herself exclusively. For Steve. Faith became a release valve. A possible soul mate. As they frequently talked about. However. Rena had little interest in staying home or engaging. In philosophical conversations about life's meaning. She avoided gluten. Favored smoothies made with green vegetables and wished she could have gone to New York Fashion Week. Steve tried to cater to Rena's whims. But the more days went by, the worse she felt. When Zoe became six months old, things changed even more dramatically. Steve was informed by Rena that her belongings had been taken by the nanny. She definitely tried on my dresses. They don't hang the same. And they're all crumpled and my eye cream. Do you know how much it costs? Almost a fortune. She complained. Steve shook his head. Doubting Faith's need for such costly stuff, his thoughts returning to Faith's gorgeous. Clear eyes. Rena continued. Accusing Faith of further offenses. Such as the missing jewels. I can't find my Cartier bracelet that you gave me. I've looked everywhere. But it's gone. Said Rena. Trying to defuse the situation. Steve said. Maybe you left it in your apartment. The man suggested that the object might have fallen somewhere. Refusing to accept the worst case scenario. With a sour gesture. Rena crossed her arms and surmised. That their nanny might have pocketed it. She hinted that it's possible the nanny had previously pawned it for very little money. Steve was doubtful of this idea and thought it was just a coincidence. So he began to doubt more and more. Although Vina's statement appeared overly confident and trustworthy. Steve remembered Faith's financial necessity. Steve, unwavering in his incredulity, maintained that Faith wouldn't have accepted it. But Rena shot back implying that everyone else was at fault. Steve advised Rena to hire spirit hunters to put a stop to the talk, while playfully suggesting that there might be a spirit in the house. Steve was dismissed at first, but later on he observed little sums of money, missing from his personal possessions, even though he didn't often spend cash. The theft started to show. Rena persisted in her criticism of Steve, accusing him of being insincere and linking the thefts to his hiring of the less fortunate. It was getting harder for Steve to ignore Rena's comments. Though he studied Faith intently, he failed to find anything in her very sincere grin that supported Rena's worries. Steve accepted Faith's innocence, while Rena countered that Faith had made mention of her need for money. Steve let himself sleep in one Sunday morning. Until the sound of a woman's scream startled him. He raced out of bed in a panic. Thinking Zoe had been harmed. But he found Faith and Rena engaged in a furious argument. In a victorious voice. Rena accused Faith of concealing the missing bracelet. Among the infant's possessions with the intention of selling it. Faith spoke forward and said. I didn't take anything. It's the first time I've seen it. With a resentful look in her eyes. Steve furrowed his brow. Still dazed from lack of sleep. Trying to take it all in. Mina questioned Faith's answer. Saying. 
It must be an accident. You can't accidentally put someone else's thing in your bag. Steve. Trying to come up with a reasonable explanation. Said. Maybe she mistook it for a child's toy and took it with the other things. Faith. Clearly distressed. Balled her fists and questioned. Why would I do that? Ignoring her own guilt. Faith replied. With a frustrated stomp of her foot. Rena insisted that Steve say something. Steve hesitated. Caught in the center, remembering the money disappearing episodes. With caution. He turned to face Faith and said. Faith. If you need money urgently. To which she retreated. Her wide eyes showing amazement. Steve took a brief break from the heated exchange. When a phone call interrupted. He went to talk to his colleague and came back. Sighing. Knowing they had to figure this out. It was obvious that Rena and Faith wouldn't get along. When the wedding was only three months away. Steve considered renting an apartment for the baby and the nanny. But he was unable to face the notion of parting ways with Faith or Zoe. After giving it some thought. Steve acknowledged to himself. How important Faith had become in his life. He was browsing his phone carelessly. When he went to his fiancée's page. And saw that none of the pictures they had taken together. Showed him grinning sincere. He scowled. Thinking back on Rena's influence and. How she always guided him to the big. Shows like a tame primate. Steve couldn't get rid of the feeling. That Rena didn't seem to share his priorities. Steve was drawn to the cocktail that Rena was holding. When he suddenly noticed the unfortunate bracelet on her wrist. He caught her in the act and questioned her. When she went into the bedroom and. Found the bracelet was missing. Rena appeared to have returned and sobered up. Prepared to make another scene. She was still wearing the same clothing from the implicating photo. And smelled strongly of smoke and booze. She shrugged her shoulders nonchalantly and conceded. Maybe a week ago. Steve realized that things had to be addressed. Because they couldn't afford to ignore the situation. Rena emphasized that Faith deserved more than. Just an apology when Steve made the suggestion. Rena said that Steve had to assure Faith that he was sorry. And ask for her forgiveness for the experience. Steve questioned Rena's involvement in the theft. After showing her the photo with the bracelet. Rena tried to make up ridiculous explanations. But Steve brushed them aside. Rena became enraged and loudly shut the door before leaving the house. When Steve rushed to Faith's room out of concern. He was shocked to see her stuffing her belongings into a suitcase. Zoe kicked at the toys above her while she lay on a kid's mat. Steve asked Faith where she was going. Startled, something inside Steve shook and churned. Stirring feelings that had lain dormant in his chest for a long time. Faith, folding her t-shirts neatly, turned around and stated honestly. I can't take it anymore. Don't worry. I'll work for a couple more days until you find a replacement. But no more. Steve resisted an overpowering inclination to charge forward. Take Faith's luggage by force. Scatter her belongings. And abandon them in the room. He knew this arrogant girl would go barefoot if needed. Wouldn't even take his spare change or someone else's perfume. Steve was deeply ashamed of himself for ever doubting her. Even for a split second. I apologize. Faith. He muttered as he stepped in her direction. His fists knotted and unclenched from a sensation of helplessness. Wanting so badly to embrace her and never let her go. Don't make hasty decisions. It's my fault. Faith took a deep. Convulsive breath and froze. Not turning around. Her shoulders twitched. Her voice faltered as she finally admitted. My little sister is sick. She has cancer and literally lives in the hospital. 
confined to IVs. It's the same diagnosis our dad had. That's probably why I went to medical school. We need money for treatment, surgery, and rehabilitation. Medications are expensive. We raise money through a charity fund. But I can't sit idly by. Mom can't work. She's always with her sister. And dad's gone. Chemotherapy helped him at first. But then his condition deteriorated. Faith glanced around. Her blue eyes sparkling like frozen lakes with tears in them. Her name is Dasha. Faith added. Cracking a small smile to describe her sister. She's only five years old now. She didn't go to kindergarten. But she dreams of going to school. I want that dream to come true. Maybe. If it would really save her. I'd steal your bracelet or the money. But I didn't. Steve muttered. Why didn't you say all this to me the first time? You think I wouldn't have helped? She asked. Erasing a tear with a shake of her head. It's not your concern. Steve put his hands lightly on the girl's shoulders and drew her in. She tightened in his arms at first. As if she was thinking about withdrawing. But finally. She gave in. And as she put her chin on Steve's chest. A cry burst out of her chest. Everything will be okay. He attempted to reassure Faith while softly patting her back. Steve was unaware of the sorrow concealed behind her soft smile. Or the strength contained in those delicate shoulders. Despite her affection for taking care of her younger sister. Faith had never withheld the sadness in their family with a word or a glance. When the nanny heard Zoe moaning about something. She pulled away from Steve and sniffed. Her nose reddening. Steve knew then that he didn't want to part from her. With a smile on her face and a wipe of her salty tears. Faith lifted her head. From his heart. Steve pleaded. Don't go away. Okay. I'll feel bad without you. The girl's face froze in uncertainty as her eyes opened. I can't cope with Zoe. And she's already used to you. You tamed me too with your blueberry pancakes. Faith. And we are responsible for those we tame. Remember? Steve corrected himself. Clearing his throat. He laughed. Trying to contain a boyish enthusiasm he hadn't felt in a long time. Though not entirely accurate. That was the truth. Steve was done wanting to go back to the deserted house. Returning to Faith and Zoe's home was enjoyable for him. He hurried to wrap up his work for the first time and get into the comfortable living room where Annie was reading a book and the baby was asleep. He'd never gone on a walk with them in his own backyard before where he'd usually merely glanced out the window at the fruit trees. He wanted to write the names of these two people who had come into his life so abruptly on every line of his day planner. So he neglected his schedule and spent time with them. He felt now that Faith, the perceptive one, was reading his soul with her intense gaze as she looked directly into his face. Steve, not knowing what he was going to say or do, drew himself forward out of impulse when she saw what he dared not utter. But then the doorbell rang. And Steve realized that he couldn't carry out whatever plan he had in mind. Realizing that the call had prevented him from making a mistake. He had to take care of himself before he could do this to Rena or Faith. He was relieved and went to answer the door. Although on a Sunday morning he wasn't planning on having guests. A man he did not know was standing on the doorstep. Seeing right once that he was a slippery kind. Steve didn't like his appearance and made it a rule. Not to recruit people like that. With his eyebrows up. Steve said. May I help you? Are you Steve Barrow? The stranger asked. Grinning widely. Then. After waiting for a reply. He opened his arms and said. Well. Meet your relatives. 
Steve instinctively disliked the blonde man and gave him a look. The guy smiled. But with a disappointed droop of his hands, Steve remained in place and the man said. Okay. Let me enter the house first. Or shall we talk on the doorstep? At that point. The man revealed his true colors. Dear brother-in-law. The truth is that you are the father of my daughter. The stranger stated. Steve gripped the doorknob tighter. Thinking he might have misheard. Meg carried my child under her heart. It took me a while to find out. When I started looking for my baby. I found out you'd taken her. I had to make inquiries. But here I am. I didn't introduce myself. Harvey Harris. And yes. I apologize for our mutual loss. Meg was a beautiful girl. She graced this world. But God takes the best to himself. Harvey said with a dejected sigh. But Steve could hardly believe his suffering. He appeared much more cunning than Rena. Despite the stranger's outstretched palm. Steve allowed him into the house with hesitation. Harvey surveyed the area. Occasionally whistling and making observations on the interior. Steve posed the direct question. Do you need a child? Harvey asked a follow-up. Do you want to be a single parent? And whether Steve really needed faith. Steve was confused by Harvey's unclear motivations. Harvey. Meantime. Wandered the living room. Examining the statuettes that the decorator had skillfully arranged. Though Steve considered throwing him out. He realized that the law might favor his father against relatives. Steve knew two things this lovely Sunday morning. He was not going to give up on faith and. He was not going to give Zoe to anyone. Steve became irate and asked why he hadn't been. Consulted prior to arriving. When Harvey finally brought up the topic. Harvey crossed his arms and explained. That he preferred to deal with significant things face to face. Pointing to Steve's wealth and business savvy as justification. Tired of the linguistic tango. Steve broke off and asked Harvey outright what he wanted. Harvey gave up on pretending. Put down a candlestick. And stared at Steve. He revealed he was in need of funding. Describing himself as a race car driver and suggesting Steve. Would be the perfect person to help him with his gift. Steve refused to accept Harvey's insistence. Shaking his head. Harvey briefly displayed a monstrous grimace. Before swiftly swallowing his haughtiness and describing. How a previous sponsorship went wrong. Because of a misunderstanding and. Scandal that hurt his reputation. Steve made a mental point to look into the specifics. In an attempt to control the topic. Steve pointed Harvey in the direction of. His relationship with Steve's sister. Meg and I did have a great relationship. After a year together. We decided to get married. Our plans were derailed when fate took an unexpected turn. During a competition in which I was hoping to win a contract. I learned of the horrible events that had transpired when I got back. Meg. Incidentally. Had mentioned you. And she had given me the impression that you would help me. A pledge she made with full sincerity. Steve gritted his teeth. Doubting everything the crafty Harvey said. Steve questioned his intentions. Asking him why he wanted to be the parent of a child. Harvey rejected the notion. Highlighting his requirement for financial and. Sponsorship help in exchange for his promise. To keep quiet about his paternity. He outlined a scenario in which Harvey would. Become wealthy and the youngster. Would live in comfort with his uncle. Harvey threatened the youngster with. Consequences if the case got to court. Implying that legal action would be taken. Steve was incensed by this statement and. Was considering a physical response. When something unanticipated happened. Both men turned to see the frightened. Shriek coming from the stairs. 
Faith lost control of a glass. Which broke at her feet. Steve saw the jagged pieces grazing her fingers. But she didn't appear to care. Her terrified eyes were locked on Harvey. Perplexed by the sudden appearance of Faith. The two men watched her pale and shaky like a rabbit frozen in front of a snake. In a terrified voice, Steve spoke to Faith. Faith. The man was determined to ask himself. Why is he here? But he was overcome with a deep need to keep Faith safe. He looked from the guide to the nurse and inquired as to if they were acquainted. Faith flinched when Harvey indifferent acknowledged their bond in a way that made her uncomfortable after his visit harvey bit the nanny one last time and left a business card with an image of a motorcycle on a low black glass table see you later faith shall i send greetings from you to your mom or little sister when i pass by he quietly requested faith stayed mute her fists clenched Harvey's last comments before leaving the house included a hint of danger. Which Steve picked up on. As soon as the door closed behind Harvey. Faith hurried to Steve. Expressing her anguish over him being a nasty man. She advised Steve not to believe anything he said. However. In the midst of her warning. Faith gasped and lurched backward. Steve. Quick to react caught her just in time and seated her on the sofa. He found a long, thin splinter trapped in the sensitive skin of her foot, which he carefully removed and treated with a first aid kit. Throughout the process, Faith stayed silent, simply saying that Zoe had fallen asleep, wanting to comprehend their link. The man asked Faith about her acquaintance with Harvey once the glass shards were disposed of and her leg was on the mend. Faith, dropping her head, tried to respond but couldn't finish. Steve spoke carefully to Faith. She seemed eager to divulge the whole truth but was wary of the man. Harvey is Zoe's father. Or at least that's what he claims. With a cry of terror, Faith started narrating the story Harvey had recounted. Breathless and skipping from detail to detail. Faith let herself enjoy herself with friends. When she turned 18. And she got to know some boys who drove motorbikes. And wore leather jackets and they seemed hip. Faith first declined the men invitation to. Continue the celebration at their house. But her friends persuaded her to accept. Since becoming an adult only happens once in a lifetime. Faith fell into the pressure from her pals. And imposed a one-hour time limit. The boys loaded them onto their motorcycles. And drove them to a residence on the outskirts. Exhausted from dancing. Faith got to ride with Harvey. Who gave her his full attention that whole night. She clarified that she didn't drink as she labored. To explain what had happened in the house. Harvey offered her a glass of juice and... Asked her to finish it when she decided to go. He also made a toast in her honor. Faith felt disoriented after drinking the juice. And the next morning she woke up in his bed. Nude. Harvey accused her of being careless since her phone. Was off and she had accepted an offer to his flat. Knowing full well what she was getting into. Faith's hands became clenched. Exposing nail marks on her skin. Steve put his palm on her knuckles in an attempt to soothe her. Steve questioned if that was the end of the story. Just to be sure. Faith shook her head. Telling her how Harvey urged her to go and threw money for a cab. He'd added a notch to the bed. And she found her dress with torn straps. Although Harvey called her his. Jubilee fool. The situation didn't end there. Just as I turned to walk away. He clamped down hard on my chin. He made eye contact with me and threatened to tell everyone. What had happened the night before if I spoke. He said he had a video that he planned to post online. 
Faith took a big breath and let it out loud. Then took her hands off of Steve's palms and massaged her face. She was no longer crying. I had no idea what to do. I felt dirty and embarrassed. My buddies told me to forget about it. But I just couldn't. I eventually called the police and made a report. But it was useless and too late. As she went on. Faith bitterly shook her head and said that. In the modern world. Winning a case like this is practically unheard of. People find it simpler to place the blame on the victim than the offender. I was charged with inflaming a well-known race car driver. And continuing to remain silent for an extended period of time. I was unable to provide any evidence. And even though sponsors shied away from him. Because of his damaged reputation. I was criticized. I felt relieved when Harvey finally vanished. Furious at me for what I had done. Now it seems strange to run across him again. Faith shook her head in shock once more. Emphasizing how shocked she was by what was happening. Steve felt a great deal of sympathy for the delicate girl. Who had experienced such a horrific event. Still. His brain was gathering all of this knowledge. Steve was left speechless. Unable to get his sisters quiet about her pregnancy out of his mind. Unknowingly. He considered Faith's statements credible even if. He didn't think his sister and the guy had a wonderful. Unadulterated love story. He leant in and kissed Faith's temple. Telling her not to expect him for dinner this evening. Just in case. Lock the doors. He repeated. He was determined not to lose Faith and Zoe. Having already lost Meg. And he most definitely wouldn't commit his sister's child to a man like that. Without knocking. Rena walked briskly into Steve's office. Ignoring the irate secretary. Steve. I understand you're engrossed in your role as the Avenger. But this evening we should taste the wedding cakes. We have no more time to put it off. She stated in a professional manner as she sat down in the chair across from him. Steve lifted his gaze from the documents the attorney had brought. There was no doubt in their ability to win the case. The attorney was a true pro. The only thing not known was how long this motor racer would be imprisoned. They found more victims as they dug deeper. Scared girls like Faith. The police had to search the man's flat after these victims provided their testimony. Taking everything from his laptop to his computer. Investigators discovered the films he had preserved as mementos and occasionally as a form of blackmail at that point. When Steve saw that his sister was on those tapes as well, his heart broke. That being said, he thought his weary sister could have reached her breaking point. Steve chastised himself, wondering how he missed it. He could not undo the past. But he could honor his sister's memory and exact revenge. The trial was set to begin this weekend and had begun a month ago. Rena came over and apologized to Faith. And after that. She and Stephen made up. She sobbed and wrung her hands. Telling them that her jealousy was due to her intense love for Steve. Who was preoccupied with the court case. He didn't think too much about getting ready for the wedding. What time? Steve inquired. Placing the folder aside with humility. At seven. The happy bride cut back. At the Eclair French pastry shop in the center. Steve nodded absently. Wondering what Zoe was thinking. The young child had been ill for a few days. And although Faith was handling things. It was clear that she was also concerned. Only Faith had doubts about the physician's diagnosis of colic. Which they had made after failing to diagnose their baby's condition. Joey would often cry. Get pale. Wheeze. Have diarrhea. And have shortness of breath. I'll sit with Zoe when you and the nanny go to court. The bride replied. Ogling her immaculately painted nails. Steve stared. 
taken aback by Rena's tenderness and willingness to assist. Again. He questioned. Seriously? I'm not a horrible person. Steve. Rena shrugged. Yes. I'm not excited about the child. But I'll try to get over it because the girl comes along with you. Are you sure you can handle it? Steve questioned warily. It's nothing to worry about. She leaned across the table and touched Steve's icy cold hand. I'll faint at the sight of a diaper. And in addition. I want you to know that I value you. I adore you and I'm on your side. Can you hear me? It matters to me too. If it matters to you. Don't get your hopes up. Though. The baby and the nanny won't be traveling on the wedding vacation. Rena chuckled. Steve accepted her assistance with an inattentive smile. Still. He was unable to give up the notion of employing a nanny to help his bride. On a special stand. The judge struck the gavel to end the court session. The decision took effect immediately. They had prevailed. Steve turned to face Faith. Who was grinning broadly. Tears filled the eyes of two girls who had never met before but embraced. Although the oppressor might have been able to scare each of them alone. When they united. They were a force that crushed him. Meg's absence still made Steve's soul dark. But it had become a little less so. He hoped his sister was feeling a bit better. 2. Well. Let's go home now. Shall we? Steve grinned and gave Faith a warm embrace as they left the stifling courtroom. Home. The girl nodded to Zoe with ease. I'm so worried. She's been much better lately. But still. I'm not used to being without her for so long. When Steve realized how effortlessly they. Had come to call the same spot home. And how devoted they had grown to tiny Zoe. Something inside of him turned over. Happy as they headed home. Steve got a call from Rena. Still driving. He poked at the speakerphone. Rena. We are already driving home. But as he heard the girl reply with tears in her eyes. His heart fell out of his chest. Rena said. We're in the hospital. Steve. As she started to cry. Zoe fell ill again. Just like before. And I had no idea what to do. I'm not a healthcare professional. Because. You know. She was throwing up. I phoned an ambulance. I was really afraid. Steve. The man swerved the wheel. Causing the vehicle to reverse. He stepped on the gas and drove quickly to the hospital. He gripped the driving wheel fiercely and asked. What on earth is this? Seldom does anything improve. Even only slightly. Before destiny intervenes once more. God. Please help her get by. Steve. Everything will be all right. Do you hear? In a low whisper. Faith seemed to respond to his thoughts. He merely gave a sharp nod. Amazingly. They made it to the hospital without getting into any accidents. With such wrath. The father examined the red traffic signals as though. He were the doctor who could save his child's life. Zoe could not have been his daughter anymore. Of course. The worried uncle was met with encouraging news by the doctors. Although the youngster is in a terrible condition. All would be okay. They assured him. We are doing research to understand what caused her illness. He stated. Steve sighed and dropped to his knees in the corridor. He asked the woman who had arrived with the infant. Where's Rena? Rather than the doctor answering. A nurse said. She wasn't feeling well. We sedated her and took her to the room. I'll show you out. Steve looked at Faith. Unsure. But she smiled and nodded. I'll stay here. The nurse was followed by the man. 
he found no one when he entered the dark ward. Then he saw Rena was in the toilet when he heard water gushing from the tap. He assumed, for some reason, that the girl was crying because she had experienced so much stress. Steve proceeded to knock on the door. But her happy laughter interrupted him before he could get a chance. It was not the sound of a scared lady laughing. Did he believe me? Rena smiled as she answered the phone. Every employee accepted me as true. I promised that was worthy of an Oscar. Although I only had a modest start. I wish I was still in Hollywood. Don't I? Steve listened to the bride's irate remarks on the phone. While standing outside the door. I refuse to allow him to adopt this young brat. The children of his sister will receive nothing from my husband's fortune. I promise. But I'm not going to give up. Know what Steve did. If you do. He's covering her sister's medical expenses. In addition. He is planning a fundraising race. Steve became pale upon hearing this. He suddenly remembered the exact moment the child's ailment started. Rena had been living with him again and giving Zoe more care. But it felt like a long time had passed. She even fed the youngster mashed vegetables. He recalled once. Rena said. My lucky charm is Steve. I had an encounter with a director even after our breakup. And to my surprise. He was an amazing person. Steve is wealthy. And I'll have complete control over everything soon. Baby. Hurry up. He will arrive shortly. In order to seem good and attractive. I want to take off my makeup. Hugs. Steve noticed this. Pulled his smartphone out. And made a call to the attorney they had just dealt with two hours before. Hello. There's another case. He said. Steve inhaled deeply of the clean. Iodized air as he looked out at the blue ocean. The waves lapping at the powder white sand. He switched off his phone to completely enjoy. His vacation since the day was wonderful. He heard youngsters laughing. Particularly three-year-old Zoe's happy play. She was cautious to go near the waves at first. But she came back a few seconds later. Her face beaming with encouragement. Steve was enthralled with his wife as she went about her day. Beaming with excitement not only from. Her sister's recovery or their happy marriage. But also from her barely noticeable round tummy. Which perfectly captured the allure of. Pregnancy from the inside out. Steve thought about how he had undervalued family. Until he had lost it as he saw Faith helping Zoe construct a sandcastle. It wasn't until he met a family that he realized. How much he wanted one. It was like discovering how much he really. Enjoyed a delicate dish after tasting it. He no longer traded his family for business. And the two sides got along just well. Faith had developed into a devoted wife and mother as well as a sincere supporter of Steve's career aspirations. It had been a difficult road to happiness, but Steve believed that moving forward there, only companions would be success and joy. Steve waved his hand and yelled out to his wife. She put a Panama hat on their daughter, who looked a lot like Meg, and said, Come help us dig a water trench. The young child waved her wet sand-decked fists, asking to be noticed. The chief builder is on the way. Girls. Equipped with a pink bucket and a green plastic spatula. Steve proclaimed resolutely. I will build you a castle so magnificent that you'll want to live in it. Steve grinned happily as Zoe clapped. Her hands in response to the concept. Yes. Ahead of us. There's only joy and success. And no other way.